welcome you, even as sub, to, to be here <laughs> to celebrate this sacrament of confirmation with us. I present to you the candidates from Mary Queen Parish who are to be confirmed. May I invite all the candidates to please stand. Cardinal Denard, these candidates have responded to Christ's call and made themselves available to him in prayer. They have learned to know him better and love him more completely through study and reflection. They have shared his love and concern for others through acts of service. That's great, Father James. Now that means that you think they should be confirmed, right? Yes, Cardinal. Beautiful. It's all I have to hear, that you think they should be confirmed. When you think that, I think that, right? You never disagree with the pastor. Why don't you have a seat, young people, for a little bit? Uh, I have to first tell you that uh, since COVID began, we have had great challenges this past year. Yeah, actually, great challenges and people preparing for confirmations. And for that reason, for about the last seven months, and I don't want to disappoint you, but I haven't been asking any questions at confirmation. <laughs> I can see you're really shook up about that. Okay, but in any case, I'm not going to ask any it's proven to be a, a wise decision. But I do want to speak to you a few moments before you're confirmed about confirmation and tonight's readings from Holy Scripture, readings that are for confirmation during the Easter season. And um, I want to start with the second reading and, and move forward and backwards. The second reading is from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians a very talented group of early Christian community whom Paul had converted and missionized, right? He was their, he was chief, really. Uh, but they were troublesome. Maybe I can use this. They were all tape, type A personalities. Maybe that might give you a sense of what, what they were like. And when he writes his first letter, to them when he hears there's trouble, that there's fighting going on. He opens up the letter as he does almost all his letters, grace and peace be yours from God the Father and the Lord Jesus. He starts praising them for a number of their gifts. But there's one gift he never mentions at the opening of the letter. It's the gift of love. And he never mentions it through chapter one, chapter two. Through th Tonight we're in the mm, chapter 12, I think. And we're getting a hint of how he's going to come at them. He speaks about how the church of which we are members, we're all parts of the body of Christ. And each of us has a spiritual, a distinctive spiritual gift. Isn't that wonderful? and they should be used for the common good. So he goes on about these gifts, but remember, there's just one spirit. And then at the end of this whole thing, Paul will write to them. You can almost look, see him looking at him. If I could speak with the tongues of angels and men, and if I had knowledge and prophecy, and I had all these things, but I lack love, then I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I had speech that was really eloquent, even if I was completely philanthropic, but I lacked love, I'm nothing. Maybe you know about that particular section of St. Paul. We hear it a lot at weddings. I think it's a fair thing to say, to say read at weddings. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love does not put on airs. Boy, that one hit them right in the jugular, huh? Etc. Etc. Love believes all things, hopes all things. In the end, three things last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. What a beautiful poem to a fighting bunch of people who called themselves Christians. And he says the origin of that, the love he's speaking about is God's love, and that's the spirit poured forth 
into our hearts. Tonight we read how the Spirit operates in the many members of the body of Christ. You are many members, but part of the one body of Christ. And all of you, I'm sure, have many gifts, spiritual gifts, maybe gifts you are discovering now. And I hope, with the pouring of the Holy Spirit tonight in confirmation, further gifts you will see. All to be used for the common good, the good of the world and the good of the church. And I want you to come forward tonight praying and convinced that the study and prayer and fellowship you've had with one another will make all of you aware of one another's spiritual gifts. And rather than fighting like the Corinthians did, that you'll support each other in your various spiritual gifts, multiple as they may be. Okay? Now, let's go to the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles sometimes sounds like a newspaper article, right? It's just one thing after another that, that uh, St. Luke, St. Luke wrote his gospel, and you know it was such a bestseller that his, that his publisher said you better write another good book, too. I'm glad some of you laughed at that because it is a joke, right? That's not what happened. But, um, but it is the kind of part two of St. Luke's gospel. And um, it's really the history of the early church, but not a chronicle. It's a theology of the history of the early church. For instance, tonight, after Saul has become Paul, and after Paul has begun the missionary journeys, and he's in the middle of one region, and, and, and he goes down and visits these people, and lo and behold, he discovers there are followers of John the Baptist. And so he has to spend some time, you know, they kind of telescope it there, to show them that John pointed the way to the Lamb of God who was coming, to Jesus. And, he, and he's such a persuasive speech that, um, that they say, well, let's be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, which they are. And then the second part happens, and this is interesting for us tonight. And then Paul, the apostle, as it were, laid his hands on them, and they received the Spirit what's going to happen to you tonight. In a sign that comes from the apostles, um, I will stretch out my hands on you in a prayer right before you come forward to be confirmed. And that, um, that's pretty ancient, isn't it? That the Christian church has been doing it that long. In the course of laying on of hands, early, early on, because we know in the second century they were already doing it in some places, was also... A, uh, an anointing with precious oil, which they spiked with perfume, okay? That's how we get the word chrism. Chrism is very perfumed oil. Um, I made 50 gallons of chrism this year in Holy Week to last us all year until next year. And that very perfumed oil, olive oil and perfume, balsam we call it, uh, I'll dip my thumb in there, and I'm going to put uh, a sign on your forehead. They used to anoint the whole body, you know, because they used to confirm people right, right after baptism. So they'd come out of the font, and they'd pour chrism all over them, and, and, and that's how they chrismated them. They confirmed them. And um, tonight, when I put that chrism on you, uh, in a sign, I'm going to say, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know what to answer. Amen. Okay. Don't forget to say amen. Now, I, I did six confirmations last week, okay? All of them had 90 plus kids. They were really good. But there's always one person and everyone that forgets to say amen. And in a stage whisper, I always say to them, say. Because I want him to say amen. Because amen means yes, I believe, I accept, I accept confirmation, yes, yes. So tonight you're signed, sealed, and delivered, just like a letter. But it's a letter of the human heart, too. The heart that the Spirit takes over and is poured into you. And, and you've prepared for this in many ways. And, and it's such a simple sign. Isn't it interesting the way Jesus gives us such a simple sign? He who himself, we heard in the first, in the gospel tonight, he, it's his first sermon in Nazareth. He stands up, reads the scriptures. Hey, boy, did you notice 
friends, it says in the reading, Jesus stood up in a synagogue as he was in the habit of doing. Uh, brothers and sisters, Jesus went to church every week. We can go to church every week, okay? I mean, that's, that's one of the things we learn from St. Luke. Um, and and he, he reads the passage, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And we find out after he closes the book, sits down and says, okay, here I am. We, we, we have to ask, is Jesus a megalomaniac? Or does he really, is he really mean this? And the whole rest of the Gospel of Luke says, yep, yep, he does. And he was not stingy with the spirit upon him, which he received already in his mother's womb, yeah, at the moment of his conception. But the spirit is always with Jesus, and he's not stingy, he wants to give it away. He wants to give it, and he does. That's why he was crucified and risen. The first words out of the risen Jesus when he appears to the apostles on Easter Sunday night, they're scared to death in the upper room. He appears, you know, because the risen body of Jesus is not confined by space and time, right? So he's there all of a sudden. He walks right through the closed doors. And he looks at them. What does he say? Peace be with you. Sisters and brothers, we should get down on our knees in thanks that he didn't say, where were you on Friday? <laughs> you know, he didn't say that at all, did he? Thank you, Jesus, my gosh. And he breathes on them to give them the first outpouring of the spirit of the risen Jesus, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. And then 50 days later on Pentecost, a driving wind comes with fire, fire and wind over each apostle as they're in the upper room. And uh, our uh, retired Pope, Benedict XVI, once said at a homily on Pentecost, the wind and fire were God the Father's first clean air act in the history of the world. As he cleaned out everything that was getting in the way of the apostles being pure spokespersons, witnesses to the risen Jesus through the power of the Spirit. And so then they had the Spirit, and boy, they really went. And that's how we get what Paul's doing. You know, they start in Jerusalem, and pretty soon they're everywhere. Sisters and brothers, that's the gift you have. How you will live out the gift of the Spirit giving to you, given to you is, is what God's grace will do for you if you stay attentive to him, and if you pay attention to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, usually which I ask and have a lot of fun with with the young people. So I can't ask you, so I'm going to ask myself. Father Dan, what are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. Did I get them right? You wouldn't disagree with me, would you? Now, of those seven gifts, the most fascinating one might be fear of the Lord. You are not receiving a gift tonight to be afraid of God, right? Fear of the Lord, what does it mean? Three words. God is awesome. That's what it means. If you understand in your heart that God is awesome, then the other six gifts make perfect sense. You'll want his wisdom. You'll want to learn his kind of knowledge, etc. Okay. So that's what's happening tonight. I'm going to say those, pray those seven gifts come over you in a, in a minute or two. And, um, uh, and and then you'll be confirmed. You'll be anointed. So it's beautiful. I have to say a word to your sponsors. Sponsors, you're good. They're going to come forward. You're going to be with them each one when they come forward to be confirmed tonight, right? And you, you know, you're supposed to put your right hand on their shoulder. I like to say you're supposed to dig your hand into their right shoulder, and it should stay there. And from tonight tonight on. Your invisible right hand is always on their shoulder. How will that be? There's never a day goes by that you don't pray for them by name, okay? Okay, sponsors. That's the one thing you do. People have asked me, what should sponsors do? Get them a gift, get them a Christmas gift every year. No, 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 you can do anything like that, but really what's important, particularly for our young people in the, in the world, in the church today, 
Pray for them by name every day that the Lord Jesus and his spirit will always touch them and be with them. So it's good. Now we have to do something before I confirm you is uh, you're going to stand up in a minute and we're going to renew the promises of your baptism. Your parents and godparents, if they're here, and by the way, thank you families, parents, godparents, thank you catechists, thank all those who have accompanied these young people to this point. Uh, and, and your parents and godparents probably remember that on the day of your baptism, they had to say the act of profession of faith for you, just like that. When I was baptized, I was like you. You're semi-comatose when you're baptized, right? Because you're just a little baby. But tonight you're not. Tonight you're going to say, I do, when I ask you those words. Do you believe in God the Father? I do. Do you believe in Jesus the Christ? Remember, Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. It means the anointed one. And tonight you become a little a anointed one. But do you believe in Jesus, the anointed one? I do. You believe in the Holy Spirit? Yep. Okay. Do you believe all that? We're going to get confirmed. So I would ask now that just those to be confirmed, the young people, will please stand for the renewal of baptismal promises. <laughs> Young people, be living members of the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Seek to serve all people like Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. And now be, before you receive the fullness of the Spirit, call to mind the faith of your baptism. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and empty promises? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who today, through the sacrament of confirmation, is given to you in a special way, just as he was given to the apostles on the day of Pentecost? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. I would now ask the rest of the assembly to please stand for a moment. Dearly beloved, let us pray 